in this course, we're going to look at arguments. Arguments, it's not just people yelling at each other. <laughs> That's just a disturbance of the peace. <laughs> now, an argument is something more than that. Uh, there are lots of paragraphs, lots of different kinds of paragraphs that we're likely to use in everyday discourse. Arguments are one of them. And in this chapter, what we're going to do, or this part of the course, what we're going to do is we're going to look at arguments, compare them to other very common kinds of paragraphs, learn to distinguish arguments from these other kinds of paragraphs. And then on top of that, we'll learn the basic parts of an argument. Here we go. Now, you might wonder why we bother differentiating arguments from other kinds of paragraphs. After all, it's really obvious to figure out what people mean. Well, <laughs> it's not always true. <laughs> uh, there's a variety of different kinds of paragraphs. Arguments are one of them. And if you aren't able to distinguish what kind of paragraph you're dealing with, you might be persuaded by it when it's not a good argument. And it really isn't until you put it in the form of an argument that you can tell whether it's a good one. So I said that one of the reasons why we're doing this is it's, it's common practice to use these different kinds of paragraphs as arguments when they don't work as arguments. You're persuaded by them. You do or believe what they want you to do or believe, but it's not through the use of reason. Uh, this happens a lot. TV ads, or any ads, right, whether on TV, movies, what you see before or after during this video, on your various social media, political ads, to buy a product, to subscribe to a service, to um, vote for a candidate, to vote for a bill. Right? Uh, most of the time, mo they're overwhelming majority of the time, they're using emotion. A lot of times fear, uh, appearances, um, what, uh, uh, vanity? <laughs> that's a big one that, the, that that's used a lot. Uh, and they, they use these uh, ads, they use these different kinds of paragraphs to persuade you to do or buy what they, what they want. Uh, but that's not a proper use of reason. Now, when you identify what kind of paragraph it is and learn how to turn that actually into an argument, you can see the glaring errors in reason. Right? But let's not get too ahead of myself. Let's take a look at these different kinds of paragraphs one by one. Descriptive paragraphs are intended to provide you with information about a subject. This uh, happens in three main ways, right? Through sensory information. Describe what a thing looks like, smells like, feels like, tastes like. Mm -hmm. uh, you can give the definition of the thing. Now, we spent a lot of time going over definitions, and I'm not going to reiterate that here. And uh, another big way is to give the purpose of a thing. That's not going to always work, but it works a lot. And we got these three main ways of describing things. There's probably not the only ways, but these are the most prominent. And it's important to remember, you know, I kind of said before, <laughs> descriptive paragraphs, right, they do not involve an inference. Right? Descriptive paragraphs do not involve an inference. And since they don't involve an inference, right, it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, something that's, uh, it's not an argument, right? There's no premises, there's no evidence, there's no inference. That's not to say that there's, you know, nothing involved with descriptive paragraphs as far as logic is concerned. After all, we spent a good long time on, on uh, definitions, but uh, it's just not nearly enough to count as an argument. A narrative paragraph is different from a descriptive paragraph, but has some <laughs> pretty good similarities as well. A descriptive paragraph is supposed to inform you about a subject, uh, to uh, you know give you information, help you identify the subject. A narrative paragraph uh, is, gives you a sequence of events. Now, they're alike in that they both provide information, but they're different in that uh, a descriptive paragraph is supposed to focus on a single subject, whereas a narrative, I mean, may or may not focus on a single subject, but it will describe a series of events. So you might describe a single subject when you say, I don't know, describe the events of your day or, you know, the, the series of trails that I took to get through, you know, to walk through this park. But, uh, you know, narrative might also talk about, um, you know, different people, right? Uh, dramas. <laughs> well, if 
if we're dealing with actual fiction as opposed to nonfiction, uh, news reports might detail various members on a, a committee in Congress, or the activities of various scientists at NASA, or uh, with the uh, American Medical Association, or it could be a variety of things. Um, you know, narrative paragraphs are giving you information, but not about a single subject and not helping to identify it. They're giving you a sequence of events. Right? Now, uh, narratives are also not arguments. There's no inference involved. Right? There's no inference with uh, narratives. I'm not trying to persuade you of some conclusion, not trying to tell you about, or not trying to persuade you that the events actually happened, Right? It's presumed that you're going to believe. The same thing with descriptive paragraphs. It's presumed that you're going to believe the person as they describe the subject, as they help you identify the subject. With a narrative, you're presumed to believe the speaker or the, or the author and describing the sequence of events. So, we got descriptive paragraphs, we got narrative paragraphs. Neither one are arguments because neither one has an inference. So the next one is very often confused with a, an argument or the use of reason. It's just a statement of belief. That's when people you know, pretty much pronounce what they believe. I'm not talking about things like, there's a tree. <laughs> I mean, sometimes that could happen, but I don't know. I believe in democracy. I believe everybody should have uh, an equal uh, right to vote. I believe everybody should have an equal opportunity to pursue how they live their own life, right? Yeah, you know, here I am just saying, I believe, <laughs> and under the proclamations. But sometimes it's just not even as explicit as that. Just things like, the universe is composed of material objects, causation, four fundamental forces of nature, and that's it. Right? That, that would just be a statement of belief. And I'm not knocking it. And people believe lots of things. And I'm not saying they're Dunskys, but it's not the use of reason. It's not logic yet. It's not logic until you actually provide evidence and an inference. I mean, a statement of belief is something more like just a conclusion. Okay? Uh, an argument's gonna have evidence which infers a conclusion. The statement of belief is probably just the conclusion. And if there's no evidence, there's no inference, I mean, you might hold the belief honestly. You might even have good evidence for the belief. Uh, you might hold it passionately. Okay, still not using logic. Still not the use of reason. It's just an assertion. A uh, argument, logic, requires much more than conviction. Instructive paragraphs bear a superficial resemblance to narrative paragraphs. And a narrative paragraph describes a sequence of events. An instructive paragraph doesn't describe a sequence of events, it prescribes <laughs> a sequence of events. It doesn't tell you what has happened or even what will happen. It's not a prediction, it's an instruction. And so this is the difference between a declarative sentence and an imperative sentence. A declarative sentence is something that's true or false. Right? There are trees <laughs> yeah, out in the park. There are trees in the park. That's a declarative sentence. An imperative would be something like, enjoy the trees in the park. <laughs> go out and enjoy the trees in the park. Or go look at the trees. <laughs> that would be an imperative. So uh, instructive paragraphs tell you to do or perform a sequence of events, but doesn't in and of itself describe a sequence of events. Instructive paragraphs are also not logic, right? There might be some sense of practical reason. Okay, right, that makes sense. These are the steps that are most likely to help you achieve your goal. All right, fine. Uh, but not theoretical logic or theoretical reason. It's not involved in what's true or what's false, only in performing actions. There's no evidence. There's no inference. There's no conclusion. Hence. There's no argument, no argument, not logic. Expository paragraphs are providing explanations. Explanations help you understand. 
This is kind of sort of similar to a descriptive paragraph. A descriptive paragraph, though, really just focuses on one subject. You know, an expository paragraph will likely use uh, a lot of descriptive description paragraphs. Or it really shouldn't even call it <laughs> expository paragraph, just an exposition, right? Uh, expositions can use a number of descriptive paragraphs, could use narratives, might even use instructive paragraphs, depending on what sort of explanations involved. Now, expo uh, expositions provide explanations. These help you understand. Now, there's a lot that can be said about the nature of an explanation, about what it is to understand. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of that here. That's a whole nother class, believe it or not. <laughs> um, expositions usually are much more broad than a single subject, much more broad than a single narrative, much more broad than a, a single set of instructions. It has to deal with a, a, usually a, a, a whole f a frame or reference of, of inquiry, right? So the physical sciences are excellent for expositions, right? As a prime example of an exposition, right? Um, trying to explain what a planet is. It's going to involve a lot. I mean, it kind of looks like a descriptive paragraph, but it's not just giving a simple definition. We're at a full exposition of, of a planet. We talk about its density and the orbit around a star, uh, the fact that it's pretty much uh, spherical. Uh, there'd be a lot involved in explaining all of these parts of what a, a planet is, well, how we know about a planet. So scienti scientific explanations, you know, anytime you're trying to explain the causal relationship between material objects, prime example of an exposition. You also have historical expositions, explaining, uh, I don't know, an event, a person, a place, right? Even words have histories. <laughs> it might be odd to think about, but words have histories. There's a time when a word started, there's a reason why it was used, there's a time when a word ends, right? You know, we hardly ever use, uh, what, uh, hitherto. <laughs> we hardly ever use that word anymore. I'm not even sure that's the right word. Uh, come hither, right? Come hither. Really don't ever use that word except, uh, you know, to be artful or uh, funny or satirical or something like that. doesn't really come up in common discourse. Anyway, histories. Also, another great form of exposition, telling us why something happened, what happened, events leading up to it. Okay. And, you know, by the way, you know, expositions in the physical sciences are very, very general, right? Uh, gravity is pretty much the same all across the universe, or at least we think it is. Right? And the scientific explanation for gravity or a planet, galaxy, a comet, whatever is going to be the same here and a million light years from here. History is not so not like that, really. You know, the history of democracy in the United States is very different than, say, Belgium. Right? Scientific explanations, very general. History, usually much more particular. Another prominent kind of explanation, exposition, psychological. Mm -hmm. Why somebody does something, how somebody acts, what is, uh, <laughs> you know, today, People's anxieties is a very hot topic in uh, psychology, and explaining the anxiety and explaining behavior in terms of the anxiety is very, very common. Anxiety, by the way, is not the only possible explanation, but it's one of them, right? That would be a psychological explanation. So expositions aren't necessarily, uh, they aren't really uh, arguments. They aren't. There's a lot of evidence, but it's mo like a like a, a descriptive paragraphs or narrative paragraphs, an exposition is supposed to inform, not persuade. That's not to say that there's absolutely no persuasion involved. So to reach a conclusion in the physical sciences or psychology or history, you have to provide a lot of evidence uh, to, and use an inference to reach the conclusion. So there's logic used in the discipline, but expositions are mostly just to inform as opposed to persuade. Right. So, um, now, having said that, it's kind of a, a gray area with expositions and argument. Uh, not every exposition, not, not, not every explanation 
is an argument. But some are. <laughs> um, it goes, it's used in an argument form called inference to the best explanation. So you provide a, a set of possible explanations and, uh, you know, for some event. And, uh, you know, the one that's most likely to have happened is the one that we infer did happen, right? Sometimes this is called Occam's razor, inference to the best explanation. Now, not, again, not every explanation is an argument. Um, and frankly, most expositions don't operate like this. You know, with inference to the best explanation, you provide a set of explanations, a variety of them, a number of them. But, you know, scientific explanation isn't really providing a set, right? The claim is, well, this is how it happened. <laughs> this is what it means to be a plan and how it's formed. Same thing with history. Now, uh, I don't know. If we you know, say something in history, we have a set of possible uh, explanations in history. Well, we might use inference to the best explanation to decide on one of them. Okay. Right. But an explanation itself is not an argument. It's, I mean, I don't want to say it's not the use of reason because you have to use a lot of reason to reach or uh, create a very good explanation. But it's not the same thing as an argument. It's not evidence with an inference and a conclusion. Now reports, reports are a little complicated, kind of like expositions. Expositions can include descriptions, narratives, even instruction, right? can include a lot. Uh, reports are complicated, right? They're very, very complex. Uh, they'll undoubtedly have uh, a number of descriptions, probably have uh, some narrations, maybe even some exposition. Now, a report is kind of the flip side of a statement of belief, right? A statement of belief is, is a proclamation of, of a belief, right? What you think is true, what, um, you know, your convictions, right? That in which you trust. Oh, okay, right? But that, that's, that's a statement of belief. A report, you know, a statement of belief is, you know, a conclusion without evidence. Yeah. A report is kind of like, you could think of it as evidence without the conclusion. Right. Uh, it could be uh, an explanation or, you know, a, a description of the set of events leading up to uh, an election or uh, a vote on a bill or um, what? A demonstration. Right. It could be the uh, stock prices for the day, the trends that have happened over the past 30 days on a stock. Uh, a report could be uh, the various statements that people have given. Uh, say, as an eyewitness, right? Or um, simply uh, as one's own expert testimony, right? You know, a scientist telling us what to expect with Haley's Comet, or um, a historian telling us uh, the events and documents, you know, the, the events surrounding, say, the Declaration of Independence, and the documents produced as a result of that. Right? So um, a report you kind of think of it as, as a newspaper article. A set of events, a description of you know, several subjects, right? And then you're supposed to draw a conclusion from that. You're supposed to draw a conclusion from that. It's the evidence. It's what's happened. And then you must make an inference or sometimes a decision, right? Reports are often used very frequently uh, for uh, courses of action. Yeah, it's different than, say, a, a instructive paragraph. Instructive paragraph, like, it's presumed these are the steps that you're supposed to take to uh, carry out some goal. You know, you don't, you're not trying to prove it. A report, you know, the presumption that this is the best, well, maybe. <laughs> but that's what the report is supposed to do. It's supposed to allow you to have all the relevant evidence to reach a conclusion, either about a course of action or a belief. So still not using logic, though, right? Reports are very useful for reasoning. Yes, they are. Reports are very useful for arguments. Absolutely, they are. But they themselves are not arguments. It's more like it's the evidence before you, draw, before you use an inference to draw a conclusion. Okay. There we go. Reports. Well, finally, we get to persuasive paragraphs. Now, uh, uh, 
I want to give kind of a word of caution here. So persuasive paragraphs attempt to, uh, um, well, you know, not make, but <laughs> the goal is to is for somebody, you know, you, the person who's listening to you, uh, to start believing some proposition, or even you know maybe to t start taking a course of action. Right? This is persuasion, as opposed to force. Right? Force is not the use of argument, not the use of actually any uh, uh, communication at all, other than you know do this. But you know, force would be to you know physically grab somebody and make them do something, right? Um, if you're trying to use force to have somebody believe something that's usually called brainwashing. Um, so you are not doing that, right? So we're, we're using persuasion as opposed to force. Now persuasion, you give somebody a, a set of reasons to believe something, a, uh, a set of propositions or belief or something like this that, uh, you know, it's offered for somebody else to believe some further proposition, right? So it'd be great if every instance of persuasion was purely cognitive, was purely uh, dealing with logic, but it's not, right? There's a good chunk of persuasion that deals just with emotion. So trying to intimidate somebody to believe something, uh, trying to uh, uh, elicit, oh, I don't know, you know, feelings of sympathy or joy or hatred, anger, right? Something to feed your vanity. That, that That's used a lot for persuasion. In fact, you see it with a lot of ads. <laughs> you know, if you don't believe me, right, look at, you know, I've, I've talked about TV ads before, so you're probably detecting a theme, but that's okay. Um, you know, look at some of these ads, say for shoes or cars or fragrances or, you know, sometimes even food. Uh, are they giving you information about the product. So if you're, you know, you're looking at shoes, they tell you what, how much weight is distributed across the sole, uh, the uh, way that it supports or, or provides support or pressure to the insole of the, of, I'm sorry, the uh, underside of the the uh, uh, heel or the arch of the foot, uh, anything about uh, its resistance to dirt or grime, or, you know, things like that, right? Doubtful. <laughs> as far as I know, they rarely even put the price, if ever, on products for shoes. But they will show you people who are athletes or even just famous uh, wearing or using the product. And this is, as I can tell, really happening with a lot of, say, social media influencers or these ads uh, before, uh, 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 you know, videos or, or whatever or, you know, Instagram. Obviously, I'm not the biggest social media mogul there is out there. Um, but you'll see these you know, little seven second, five second ads just showing you somebody really good looking or famous or, or using a product. And then you, oh, I have to get that. Well, that's manipulation, right? That's using emotion to get you to buy the product. It's not the use of reason. Yeah. And in this course, when we're talking about the use of reason to persuade you, uh, for a belief or to justify a belief, right? That's what we call an argument, right? an argument. Now, I, I, again, don't, I don't mean, you know, two people yelling at each other and getting very angry, right? That's not what I mean by an argument. Uh, what I mean by an argument is a, uh, is somebody who's offering a set of evidence, right? Propositions that are true or false that infer a conclusion, right? So we have three parts to an argument. You have the evidence or the reasons, or the premises is what they're most often called. And we use that in this course, premises. Uh, you'll have the conclusion, right? Which is the proposition that's justified or inferred by the premises. And then the inference itself. Okay, so let's let's take a look at premises just real quick. What you'll need to do in this course, what will you be tested on, is learning how to identify premises versus conclusion. Kind of a heads up, the inference is almost never stated. Right, the inference itself what inference is used is almost never stated. I think maybe in some academic journals when the inference was, you know, was not evident, right? It's a specialized sort of inference. Oh, okay, then then you'll use uh, the, <laughs> then you'll explicitly state the inference in, in a plain language argument. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes. But in everyday discourse, nobody ever cites the rule that they're using to infer the conclusion. Most often they'll just say something like, well, it logically, it follows that. It's like, okay, what's the rule? What's the rule of inference that justifies that, that conclusion? And, and uh, you know, even right now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait, what rules? 
It's like, yes, there are rules for inference. Right? There are rules for inference. A good chunk of this course will be identifying those rules. But we'll get to that. In the meantime, look at the premises and the conclusion. So the conclusion is, depending on the argument, there can be lots of conclusions, but usually in any given, uh, say, public, you know, public piece of public piece of argument, uh, there's just one conclusion, at least the one that's mentioned. It's usually uh, uh, given. It's, it's you know, it's what it is inferred by the premises. You know, premises will be a proposition or set of propositions to infer the conclusion. The conclusion is what's inferred by the premises. Right? So usually the conclusion is one sentence. And in most paragraphs, it's either going to be the first or the last. Right? So finding the conclusion versus the premises in terms of the order of sentences, that, you know, that, that, that's your first bet, right? The first or the last. It would be pretty bad writing to embed the conclusion somewhere in the middle of a paragraph or somewhere in the middle of the premises. That would be bad writing. Um, and the conclusion is it's usually given by an indicative word, something like therefore. Right? Or it follows that, or thus. Right? These are really good indicator words for the conclusion. And so if you identify the conclusion, well, then you know the rest of the sentences are the premises. Now, that's kind of a mechanical way of going about doing it. Uh, it's a, you know, a checkbox way, a, a not a very cognitive way of doing it, but you know, it's just following a simple set of procedures. And if that's what you have, that's what you have. Right? The best way to figure out the conclusion, though, is to figure out what is inferred. Right? The direction of inference, we might call it. It's not a very, not a great term, <laughs> the direction of inference, but it's what we got for the moment. Um, it, it, it's what is inferred by the premises. So you figure out, you know, maybe a better way of doing this, you know, separate out the sentences and try to figure out, okay, which one is inferred by the rest. Now, We'll work on that skill much more during the course of the semester. Uh, it will be part of your task to figure out the conclusion from the uh, uh, versus the uh, premises versus the evidence. And one way that I'm going to do that is I'm not going to include the indicator word like you know therefore or thus or it follows that or in conclusion. Right? I'm not going to do that. Uh, you'll have to, it, it's as you master the inference better and better, you'll be able to recognize the form. Right? That, that's, that's what I'll be testing you on. So the conclusion is what is inferred by the premises. The premises are what infers the conclusion. And the inference is what does the job, right? What's the rule right, that uh, 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 is used right, to draw out that conclusion from the evidence?